The deep web is one of the most amazing things on earth, not because of how joyful it makes people or anything, but because it is completely uncensored view of people. You can speak your mind, buy what you want, do anything you want, when on the deep web you have complete and total freedom. I had always been fascinated by the deep web, and at the time of this event and this story occurred, I was in college. Lots of people at my campus had really been getting into accessing the deep web. It was almost like a trend, with so many people getting in on it, it seemed perfectly safe for me to give it a try. Now I had always heard of the deep web, horror stories. Stories of hacking, stumbling on disgusting sites, and people even somehow finding your address. These stories were mainly what kept me off of the deep web. But with most of the people at my college using it on a normal basis, I decided to give it a go. I asked a friend to come over and help me set it up. When my friend arrived, we opened up my laptop and began to set everything up. He told me we were using Tor, a program that lets you access deep web. He also asked me if I was planning on doing anything illegal, to which I replied no. He said that since I wasn't, we didn't need to install Tails, which apparently is a software that makes it more secure if you plan on doing illegal things. A little while later, everything was set up. I had my new IP address and my friend gave me a brief rundown of what to do and what not to do. He made it very clear that when I was using the hidden wiki, that I keep it on censored mode so that it wouldn't be less likely for me to see something I didn't want to see. After about two weeks of using the deep web, I felt like a pro. I had accessed many different sites, spoken with some great people, made friends, even bought some weed. I had become cocky and was ready to dig deeper into the dark web. I turned off the censor mode on the hidden wiki and began to browse the links. It took a while, mostly because Tor is a bit slow and many of the links just led to dead web pages. Eventually I stumbled on a site called All the Gore. It was mainly a big chat room with many different topics. I had fairly a strong stomach. I had seen some violent movies and had seen beheadings, killings, etc. through the normal internet. After looking at a few different chat rooms, I noticed how sick this site really was. The people in this chat room were actually killers, bragging about some of the things they had done. In the chat room, you could also post pictures. One man by the name Culture045 had the stage in one of the chat rooms. He was explaining in detail how he had broke into someone's house, kidnapped a little girl, and brutally killed her parents by hiding under their bed and then opening their throats. He then explained how he brought the little girl back to his house, raped her, beat her, and cut her up. I didn't think he was telling the truth at first, but then he posted pictures. They were the most horrifying pictures I had ever seen. Close-ups of the poor 8 to 10 year old girl being brutally raped, beaten, and cut with a knife. Culture kept posting pictures. The ones were the little girl tied to a chair, bleeding, crying, throwing up, etc. Then he showed a picture of him with a drill drilling into her skull. The most haunting part is that while he was doing it, he was looking at the camera with the sheer joy on his face. I had seen enough and typed in the chat room, you people are sick, you deserve to die, how can you sleep at night? Immediately people began making fun of me, saying that I was just as helpless and ignorant as the little girl in the picture, and that I should get off the big boy part of the internet. They began saying I was a pussy and calling me an empath. When Culture typed something in the chat box, he said, really? Where do you live, buddy? I'm sure everybody would love to see you on this site. I then made the biggest mistake of my life and typed, I'm calling the police and having this site shut down. Less than a minute later, everything on the site went black and then a new chat box appeared in green. In it, someone named Admin1 typed in the box. He said, call the cops and you will regret it. I didn't type anything in the box and reached for my cell phone. What happened next haunts me to this day. My phone said I had a message. I opened it and it said, call the police and you're dead. There was no number. It didn't even say unknown number. It was just blank. I looked back at my laptop and saw my webcam light turned on. I quickly covered it, but I saw on the screen a picture of me looking at my phone. I got wide-eyed and froze for a moment. When the admin typed again, put the phone down right now and uncover your webcam. I put my phone down but kept the webcam covered, 
When he typed again, okay then, be like that. Right after, he posted my full name, age, and address in the chat box and typed, It would be a shame if you and your college buddies went missing, wouldn't it? He said. I then did as he said, and uncovered my webcam. He then told me to follow his instructions on how to make it impossible for me to reach the site again. I followed each and every one. When I finished, I got a text that said, Now don't ever try to come back. Just like before, he had no number. It still called the police from my friend's phone, but they were never able to find the site. If you ever go on the deep web, don't ever just mindlessly explore, especially if you don't have additional software to keep you more secure. I was a stupid college kid, and I just hope nobody makes the same mistake I did. I moved to a different home and changed all my information, but I still get nightmares to this day. Fast forwarding a few days, and I was still extremely rattled by what had happened. The police tried to track down the website, but since there was no way for them to recover my history, I had originally found the sick site by just randomly clicking links. It seemed pretty hopeless to find it. The police told me to change all my information about myself and to move in with a friend. After changing pretty much all of my information, I decided to move in with my friend David. David was an extremely honest, hardworking person. He never went to parties, slacked off, got drunk, high. He was very dedicated to finishing college. In fact, he was one of the few kids I knew at the time who wasn't getting on the deep web regularly. I had told him all about my experience with the deep web and that's mostly why he agreed to let me stay with him. One night, we were both up studying very late when my phone went off. I looked to see who had texted me and saw that the person sending the message had no number, just like last time. It read, check your computer. There was nothing else to it, just one simple instruction. I opened my laptop and when I did, I noticed that I didn't have control of the mouse. I tried to move it, but the mouse just moved on its own. Someone had remote access to my computer somehow. I never gave anyone remote access before, uh, I tried a whole bunch of keyboard commands, but not a single one worked. I noticed that whoever had control of my laptop was downloading a software, most likely malware, but there was nothing I could do. I heard my phone go off again, and this time the message read, Look out your window. I was sitting right by a window. I didn't know which window the guy was referring to, so I looked out the one I was sitting by and saw a man in the parking lot leaning up against a white van. He had a phone in his hand, and when I looked at him, he nodded. My phone went off again. Type in and hold down Shift Alt F5 at the same time to activate the software. I called in David to my room to show him what was going on. He seemed just as nervous as I was, but with the man just outside our window, we didn't want to anger him. David called the police right away and told me that they would be there soon. I didn't activate the software and just sat there. Eventually I got another text, I'm coming in if you don't do it right now. I didn't know why he or the person in control of my computer couldn't do it, but I didn't dare to ask. At the same time though, I was 99% sure that this program had malware or spyware or something that would be very harmful to my computer, so I refused to activate it. David grabbed a baseball bat just in case the man outside tried to come in. About 5 minutes later, we. We heard the doorknob turning. It was locked, but we then heard banging on the door. We both freaked out, and I looked out the window again. Sure enough, the man and the van were gone. The banging on the door got more and more violent, until eventually we heard a horrible scratching sound. At least a few more minutes, and then we heard footsteps walking down the hall, and eventually fade away. I received another text, we will be back. That really got to me. When the cops arrived, they told me to look at my front door. I followed them back out of the hallway and saw engraved in my door my name. The police began to investigate the whole building and they had a tech police officer come in and look at my computer. He began to do scans and investigate the weird software on my laptop. Eventually he managed to close and remove it and told me that my laptop isn't safe. He said the core files of it had been hacked into corrupted. We did a complete wipe of my laptop and he looked at my phone as well. Just like last time, he couldn't tell me where the messages came from and told me that they would be sure to keep the cops nearby in case anything ever happened again. 
The next day, I had just got home from school and was very tired. David wasn't home from school yet, so I went into my room and fell into the bed. I had just began to close my eyes when I heard a rattling sound in my closet. I lifted my head up and didn't hear it again, so I went back to sleep. After a few minutes, the closet door swung open. I leaped out of bed and saw a man with a mask walking over to me. I ran for the door and slammed it behind me. I ran out to the parking lot, started my car, and drove away as fast as I could. By the time the police arrived, the man was of course gone. The apartment surprisingly hadn't been wrecked or anything. We didn't even find anything stolen. He didn't seem to do anything at first. Um, that night, two police officers were monitoring everyone who came in and out of the building in order to catch the man. I opened my laptop and noticed that my wallpaper had changed. It was just a bunch of trees, but it had been changed to a sickening photo of a man with a mask. The same mask that I saw on the man who was in my closet, digging a knife into a baby's eye in what looked like a small cabin. I also noticed that all my applications and programs were gone, and I saw the same software as last time, right in the middle. I clicked on it, and it had already been installed, just like last time. It filled the entire screen, and what looked like a live stream was going on. I couldn't exit out, and the live stream was coming from a boy's house. He looked about 13 or 14, and was at his computer. It didn't take long for me to see that I was watching through his webcam, and he had no idea. I saw a small chat box pop up in the right top corner of the screen, and in it, someone typed in the box, Welcome to our live stream. We are glad everyone could be here. Thank you, John, for being here as well. My eyes got very wide. My name was John, and they were waiting until I was watching to start the live stream. As I watched, I saw that the closet door behind the poor boy slowly opened, and a man walked out with a toolbox in one hand. He quietly set the toolbox down and pulled out some duct tape. He went behind the kid and put the tape over his mouth and grabbed him tight. The poor kid's face was total fear. He tried to scream, but he couldn't because of the tape. They were making a decent amount of noise, so it told me that the kid must have been home alone. I tried hard to exit out, but I couldn't. I then saw the man take out a screwdriver and drive it into the kid's chest. Blood began to pour out, and the kid made an awful wheezing type noise. I saw tears come from his eyes, and the sick man began to drive the screwdriver deeper and deeper, and then yank it out. The man then took out a hammer and smashed the kid's hands several times till they were nothing more than a mangled bloody mess. I tried every command I could to exit out, but nothing was working. I noticed that the chat box several people were cheering the man on and requesting for him to do different things to the boy. The man then took out a handheld electric saw, pressed it against the boy's face, and turned it on. The boy screamed with pain as the saw went up into his eye, causing blood to go everywhere and got the camera a little as well. I started to get tears in my eyes as I couldn't stop it. Then, the man took the screwdriver, gouged out the kid's eyes, and took out a large knife. He proceeded to slit the boy's throat and tossed him on the ground. I was sick. I threw up all over the floor, and when I looked back, I saw the chat box, people typing in horrible things like, Oh my god, that was wonderful. Thanks so much for doing this, etc. In the box, I saw someone named Culture045 type in the box. Thanks for watching, John. After that, the program closed on its own, and I was left with the sickening wallpaper. I was sweating, breathing heavy, and feeling sick. Throughout the entire thing, I didn't realize that my phone had gone off several times. I looked at it, and most hateful, mean messages were coming from my friends and family. I asked my mom what was wrong, and she texted back, you sent that sick, disturbing live stream to everyone. I can't believe who you are. The police have been called. I felt even more sick than before. Those monsters had sent the live stream to all my friends somehow and made it come from me. They had pretty much ruined my life within a couple of minutes. When the police arrived, I told them everything that had happened and quickly they managed to explain to my friends and family what had happened. They really cracked down on finding these people. And a month later, four men had been arrested. One was Culture 045, the other was Admin 1, and the two others were working with them. The site was found and shut down as well, and I got a new laptop and phone. 
I could say some horror cliche and say something like I kept getting texts or kept hearing weird things after since, but none of that happened. They were arrested and I never heard anything further. It's good to know that those men are in jail or perhaps even dead, but what scares me is all of the other people watching the live stream who were there for pleasure are still out there and that there is probably thousands of other culture 045s out there all over the world. If you ever go on the deep web, make damn sure you're as careful as possible. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I would like to extend a huge thank you to Slumlocker for his help in this video. He was one of my early inspirations and a great help when I started off my channel, helping and collaborating with me from very early on. He took a break, but he's back now. So if you enjoyed his narration today, please go over to his channel and show him some love. If you enjoyed the video, be sure to smash that like button and subscribe, as you won't want to miss what I have in store for you next. And if you have had a creepy or paranormal experience that you wish to share, feel free to send it to my email which you can find in the description. Be sure to follow me on Instagram and Twitter as I post updates and behind the scenes. But anyway, for now guys I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one. In retrospect, it's kind of ironic that my love for science I chose would be my predicament. I mean, it looks unfair that my curiosity and thirst for knowledge would lead me in such a shady path. Only thing I ever wanted was to be better at my job. I am a medical student, and for as long as I can remember, I myself was fascinated by the human body. No matter how bad we treat it sometimes, it is nothing short of perfection. The structure and function of the organs, the delicate high-functioning brain, the blue snake-like veins carrying the blood into the heart to be cleaned and recycled, it's simply magnificent. It was a simple choice for me. I wanted to study more about the body learn about all the details that it hides, and sometimes rectify it. Now don't get me wrong, I didn't really enjoy studying to get into medical school. Most of the time, it was a tedious process of learning about irrelevant topics that I didn't really care about. But I managed to pull through and get into the university. There I developed very mixed feelings. Although some lectures were diving into the secrets of what we were supposed to be learning about, most were simply stuff read from a PDF presentation by a semi-bored professor. The kind of knowledge that you could acquire by reading some science magazines. Magazines that I had already read. So most of the time, I went to the campus feeling indifferent secretly hoping that I could get to learn something amazing, like perhaps a new fun fact in the anatomy class, but that was rare. I can't say that I have many friends. Come to think of it, I don't really have any. I'm friendly with all my classmates and peers, but we don't really have anything else in common, other than that we study the same subject. They didn't study the way that I did. Most of them valued the prestige and paycheck that comes with being a doctor. Some truly wanted to help others in times of sickness, but no one wanted to actually learn. Not the way I did. They consumed themselves in parties, drugs, and sex with each other, 
Well, I went the extra mile and I studied something more than the given material every night. Just to tame my lust for knowledge. I remember the day Jonathan approached me in the campus cafeteria. It was in a break between some of the classes that we both participated in. He sat opposite to me and asked me how I was doing. We chatted a bit about everything and nothing, and mostly regarding some projects we were working on as homework at the time. I like this guy. Jonathan wasn't the best student or the most intriguing person, but I knew that he also truly loved medicine, and he tried his best to learn more than what the university spoon-fed us. I respected him for that. And so it came as a pleasant surprise when he introduced me to a new idea. Hey man, he said. I know that you feel really bored here. I sort of get it too sometimes. Boy was he right. I found this guy that really knows his stuff. He continued. And then more hesitantly. There is a link to the dark web of a very good doctor. His methods are a bit unconventional, so he can't broadcast for the normies. But he is really skillful. I mean at least his teaching has helped me with a lot of my exams. He laughed at this. I thought about it for a while before answering. Sure, I said. Let's see what this mysterious doctor has to offer. By then, I had read many books and articles already, and I would give anything to see something fresh. Jonathan smiled and gave me a note with the alleged link. Nice bro, if you need any help with this dark web thing, just give me a call. My phone number is also on that note. It would be cool to chill out in the doctor's chat room and learn from him. I didn't have to call him. I politely said goodbye as he left and I resumed with my lunch. But I was curious now. I am by no means a computer guy, but I can work my way through some stuff. And so I won't bore you with the details of how I got to the site. Most of you here are familiar with this kind of story anyway. The path is simple. You get the appropriate software to enable you to go into the deep web and then you start searching. You have to be very specific in what you're looking for, otherwise you'll get lost in a mountain of cyber junk. And specific I was. I got to the link I wanted to relatively fast. It was a site called Anatomy 102. It had a plain gray template and the classical ancient Greek symbol of medicine as a logo. A snake wrapping itself around a rod. Although, it was a little different than the usual one. The snake looked like it was biting on something. And that something sort of resembled a human skull. And that looked a little peculiar. There was a camera focused on an empty white room and also a chat room. The chat room had around 50 people active, casually talking about various medical specializations, speculating what they would learn about today. Around 10 minutes later, two people appeared in the room, both wearing the typical Operation ROM uniforms, dragging a big table of surgery tools with them. One of them disappeared from the screen, and the other stood in front of the camera still wearing the mask. Hello my great audience, it brings me great pleasure to see so many of you here today. This is a place of learning and understanding, so I would advise all of you to pay attention and observe the details. I like this intro, a true professor. For all those who happen to be new here, let me introduce myself. I am going by the name Dr. Mason here, but you can address me as Doctor in the chat. Every two weeks, we gather around here to discuss something about anatomy and how it works in practical ways. As he finished his words, 
the second guy got into the frame again, this time pushing a surgery table before him. And the table was full. I guess it had a dead body or a sleeping person on it. By that time, the content in the chat room read 250 online. The other guy was also wearing a mask, and he took the sheet that was covering the body on the bed to reveal something that I was not prepared for. A living human, fully awake, muffled and tied on the bed with leather straps. He was middle-aged with brown hair and a very scared look in his eyes. The man was sweaty and in obvious distress, but he couldn't do much, tied like a piece of meat as he was. As you may know, the doctor continued, the digestive system is one of the most important systems in the human body. It is the source of all the energy input and output of animals. Today, we'll give it a closer look. The chat box was filled with lots of expressions of happiness, as people seemed to be content with the idea of the lesson. I, for once, felt nervous. I could never expect what followed next. The doctor started operating on the man on the bed without using any anesthesia. He cuts open an incision in his belly while the man screams or drowns behind the muffler. After that, he started taking parts of the victim's intestines out and showing them on the camera, talking in detail about everything and also applied pressure at certain points to demonstrate what he was talking about, generating huge amounts of pain for the helpless victim. During the whole process, he showed no hint of emotion. The chat was filled with questions, most of which he replied to, the same way our professors talked to us back in uni. He paid extra attention to those who wanted him to experiment on the limitations of the victim. He noted that the people asking those questions had true motivation to learn and will progress in their career. After that statement, he followed through with the suggestions that were given to him. Blood had started to make a puddle on the floor. Every now and then, the victim would faint by the sheer pain that he felt, but the doctor's helper would wake him up every time. The doctor insisted that it is important for the patient to have his senses in order for us to take notes on his reactions. I was shocked, but I couldn't look away. It was the same feeling when you saw a gruesome accident on the street. You know that if you check to see what happened, you'll have the urge to throw up, but you still turn your head and look, your eyes thirsty for the odd and the gore. The procedure is getting more and more extreme. The incision was even bigger now, and the doctor is explaining the reflexes of the stomach while holding the actual man's organ in his hand. He applied pressure to it and a wave of gastric fluids went through the now crying man's esophagus, choking him up as he was lying face up. It didn't last much longer after this. The victim went unconscious and it seems that even the helper couldn't bring him up anymore. After a few tries, the helper looked at the doctor and nodded. The doctor then returned his face to the camera. All right, class. That's all I had to talk about today. Any questions? A few messages appeared in the chat box and he selectively answered some of them. Unfortunately, that's all the time that I had for today, he said. And then he continued. Okay, who would like to volunteer for the next lesson? The chat was suddenly silent. Oh, come on, uh, such a shy audience. You'll never become true scientists if you are afraid to take risks. But anyhow, most of you know the procedure. If no one volunteers, I will randomly choose someone from the chat. And by next lecture in two weeks' time, he will be the person in the bed, leading all of you guys into enlightenment. To be honest, the patient's job is more important than mine. I am just explaining things, so he should be very proud and cherish the fact that he is actually the real teacher. 
still silent. All right then, but I'm not happy about that. He went on. Let me find someone myself. He appeared to be searching for something on his monitor. Username HealthyRaven96 will be with us for next lesson. I'll see you all then. HealthyRaven96 got instantly disconnected. The others started to log out too, while some stayed to discuss the lesson. I turned off my PC. What had I just watched? This was more like a call than a classroom. It wasn't natural to use a human guinea pig for teaching. But still, I learned so much. This person talked with so much passion for science and had a strange charisma that you may even call charm. But no matter, I decided to never open the site again. I was not going to be participating in this illegal situation. I knew how wrong this was. But deep inside me, my everlasting thirst was still demanding more. I broke my promise two weeks later. It was the day of the supposed lecture, and I just couldn't take it out of my mind. I logged in for Anatomy 102 once again. This time, a young woman was on the bed. The process was similar. Dr. Mason introduced himself and started his lesson, this time focused on the nervous system. I was hooked before I even knew it and I watched the entire talk without even flinching this time. Until the moment that the unlucky girl was dead, I hadn't even moved from my chair. And this became a part of my life. I was following every lecture showing 100% attendance. I watched as men, women and some rare times even underage people were brought to their untimely death for the sake of science. I started participating actively, asking questions about amputations and tissue damage, and sometimes I was the one who suggested the craziest experiments. I wasn't addicted to the gore in particular, but it was a small price to pay for knowledge. I learned so much, for example, that the pain threshold we are taught that the human body can withstand is bullshit. I saw with my very own eyes how much the human organism can suffer before giving up for good. That and many other things that are not to be told in this post. The months went by fast. I kept watching the lectures. Some rare times, there was someone inspired so much from the doctor's words that he or she would volunteer for the lesson, making all of us sigh in relief. But those times were rare. It was mostly Russian roulette every week. I was scared of course, but the risk was well worth the reward. And at the same time, I studied even harder, completely locking myself out of the real world. I wanted to learn even more now, so much that I was inspired by this masked man. And then the day came which I never expected to come. When the doctor had finished a lecture, slowly turning a man's brain into mashed potatoes, and as always, was looking for a volunteer. After the usual awkward silence, I heard something truly terrifying. Okay, students. Next to come here with us will be... Lotus Eclipse. My username... My stupid username made us a pun of my favorite car. I thought that this might happen, but never actually thought that it would. The chances were always pretty low and I was enjoying the classes way too much to stop. For the first time since that fateful day that I had learned about this damn site, I called the only man that could understand me. Jonathan. He picked up the phone. We talked for a long time, and in the end, we managed to formulate a solution. We spent the rest of the time until the lecture in my house. We were together all the time in order to succeed what we planned. 
Three days before the lesson was to happen, we were attacked while we were in the house. I don't know how they found us, but truth be told, the Dodger had never failed to locate his forced volunteer. He was with his helper, as I had predicted. Jonathan had a flash earlier this weekend and bought his gas mask as a precaution. I don't know how he foresaw that, but we were prepared for the gas that our stalkers had used that night. I guess that's how the Dodger managed to get his victims in the operating room in one piece every time. People perhaps were prepared for an assault, but very few had thought of that. I was lucky to have access to a gun, an heirloom of my early past father, and I managed to shoot the knee of the doctor before he could attack. The helper was not much of this ice cold man I had thought of when I watched the live streams. He was very willing to help us with whatever we wanted in exchange for his life. After I had got all the information that I wanted, I put one shot right between his eyes just to get his annoying whining out of my ears. And here we are today, as I'm typing this, I hear the muffled voice of a man behind me. It was easy to get the codes for the streaming and the doctors using him and password from the crying helper pleading for his life so that I could continue the job and the idea that he had started. I felt that he had helped me a lot during this time and it was time for me to help others myself. With Jonathan on my side, we would venture into new experiments which no one had even dared to conduct. We would take science and medicine many steps ahead through our will to try new things. But it just felt right that I would give Dr. Mason a great gift. He always believed that the man in the bed was doing the greater sacrifice, and I wanted him to have his honor for his last ever appearance in the classroom. His screams and violent shaking on the bed, though, gave a different suggestion. I guess he wasn't such a believer and pioneer as I always thought. But no matter, the time is now for someone new to take his place. Someone with vision, skills, and cunningness. Someone like me to continue his work. And so friends, I invite you all to join us. We will learn together and find answers to all the questions we still have for the human body. So that in time, we can have perfect knowledge of medicine and its practices. Come to the stream and be a part of the class. As we'll examine all that there is to the human organism. And feel free to ask questions if you like. My helper and I will be happy to answer them, or show some real life examples to help you understand better. And now, if you'll excuse me, the lesson is about to start, and I have planned a very special lecture as a parting gift for Dr. Mason. I will see you all in class. This all started a week ago, when I lost my job and I was running behind on bills. I lived in a simple house and that job was all that held my life together. After a night of drinking and watching TV, I started looking for a new job. Most of them looked boring, just 9 to 5 office jobs, but one caught my eye. It was an ad to the side of the screen that read, High paying jobs for hire. This isn't just your normal 9 to 5 job. In desperation, I clicked on the shady ad. Slowly but surely, a new website loads with multiple links to different jobs with different descriptions. Deep web jobs. 
house sitting. $100 per shift. Stay in a camera room and watch all the rooms. Keep the house safe. Rules and link. Seems easy enough. I thought to myself, God, do I regret that. Crop harvest. $150 per field. Harvest a field of corn. Tools are provided. The rules and link. Reading down all of the jobs, the house sitting seemed the easiest, so I clicked on the link, eager for that $100. On the screen, a sign-up sheet popped up, asking for my email. I typed it in quickly, and I was met with the message. We hope to see you soon. Satisfied with that, I hopped in bed and I turned off the lights. I started to drift off when I hear a buzz from my phone. Irritated, I get up and I check my phone. A new email. I thought to myself. I clicked on the notification. Your application has been accepted. Thank you for applying to the house sitting job. You will stay at the house from 12 a.m. until 4 a.m., and you must follow these rules. Your money will arrive at 6 a.m. after your shift. Always, no matter what you hear or see, stay in the camera room. Either don't bring your phone, or if you do, do not turn it on, even if you get a notification. I will not email you during your shift. Make sure to bring something that can play music fairly loudly. Arrive at 12 or a little before 12. If you arrive past 12, do not enter the house and send me an email. From 12 until 1, you are allowed to roam the house, but make sure to be in the upstairs camera room by 1. Turn all the lights off, lock the doors, and close the blinds. From 1 until 2, Watch the cameras. If you see a man in the living room watching TV, turn that camera off until you hear the TV turn off from downstairs. Ignore any sounds you hear around the house. If you feel anything touch you, stop moving and close your eyes until the feeling goes away. From 2 until 3, open the blinds in the camera room. If you hear a voice from the window, do not look at them. The conversation will be normal and once they say goodbye, it is safe to close the blinds. This event can happen at any time in the hour. If you see a woman cooking in the kitchen, you have a blue button on your desk that turns on a loud sound in the kitchen. Press and hold that button until the woman disappears. From 3 until 3.33, turn on your music device as loud as possible. Cover your ears, close your eyes, and ignore any sounds or movements around you. If the music stops, make any sound of your own to drown out what is happening around you. After 3.33, you are allowed to roam the house until 4. Do not leave before 4, and do not leave more than 5 minutes after 4. If any rules are not completed correctly, Hide under the desk and do not move until 4. That is all. Your shift starts tomorrow night at 471 Pedersen Drive. Sincerely, Mr. Salazar. I must have read that email 10 times over, thinking that this was a prank or something. No way do I actually have to follow these crazy rules. I thought to myself, entranced at how specific the rules were. I put my phone back down to charge and I went to sleep, still confused by that email. All I could do the next day was think about what that email said. The man in the living room, the woman in the kitchen, conversation with the person in the window. It all seemed too crazy to be true, but I couldn't help but find myself 15 minutes before 12 with an old iPod in my pocket. Standing at 471 at Pedersen Drive. I entered the house. It had a sort of old but still livable vibe to it. 
The house was dusty, but the kitchen and living room were spotless. I made my way upstairs and at the end of the long hallway stood the camera room. It was barren and small, with nothing but a chair, a camera monitor, and a couple of windows in it. I sat down in the chair. Man, I hoped that this was worth it. It wasn't. Looking at the computer's clock, it read 12.03 a.m. I have one hour to look around the house. First, I head back to the living room. I close the blinds, lock the doors, and I turn the lights off. I repeated that for all the rooms, and at 12.56, I was back to the camera room. As soon as it hit 1 a.m., I felt a sudden dread, telling me to get up and leave right now. I turned on all of the cameras, and on the back of my neck, it felt as if a feather was resting on it. I froze. Keep calm, Chris. Keep calm. I closed my eyes as I remembered the rules. It felt like hours, that feather tickling the back of my neck, but I held out, not moving and keeping my eyes closed. The feather went away. I opened my eyes relieved, and I heard behind me slow, coordinated footsteps. I whipped around and the footsteps went away, and a slow chuckle came from the camera speaker. The man was watching TV. The TV was lit up with some cooking show, and the man was chuckling while watching the show. I turned that camera off, and I hoped that I had done it fast enough. The sound from the TV echoed up the stairs, chilling me to the bone. What the hell is this place? I thought to myself, feeling queasy. And how is it only 1.20? The next 20 minutes were as creepy as can be. Unknown sounds bounced around the house, the man laughing at the TV, watching all the cameras until the silence hit me hard. The TV had been turned off, and dread had fell upon me again. The noise from the TV had been a constant for the past 20 minutes, but now that it was off, the silence felt threatening. I slowly turned on the camera and I found the room to be empty. I sighed in relief. For what felt like an eternity, my eyes darted around the cameras, on edge until the clock made a quiet beep, and it turned to 2 a.m. I rose from my chair and I opened the blinds revealing the pitch black lawn outside. I sat back down as the clanging of pots and pans ringed in my ears. I looked down at the blue button beside the monitor, and then at the lady, now cooking black eggs in the kitchen. As I was about to press the button, Hi, Chris. A woman's voice came from the window. I froze, gluing my eyes to the monitor, forcing myself not to look at the window. Hi, how was your day? My voice was shaky. It was obvious that I was scared. I was just strolling around the neighborhood. I saw that you were here and I just wanted to say hi. The window that she was talking to me through was high enough up the ground to need a large ladder to get to. How was your day? My day... it was fine, thanks. The woman in the kitchen started to get louder. Okay, well, I have to go. It was nice to meet you. It was nice to meet you too. Bye. I wanted to get up. I wanted to just close the blinds and never hear her voice again. But something just told me that I should not get up. Wow, you're a smart one. I thought that would get you. Maybe next time. Goodbye. I waited a few seconds. The last thing that I wanted to see was the face of that lady talking to me. So I waited until I was sure that she wasn't there anymore. And 
then I closed the blinds. Once that ordeal was over, I realized that the lady in the kitchen was gone, even though I never pressed the button. Oh no, no, I thought. I had broken one of the rules, and it was only 2.30. Now I'm sitting under the desk, typing this out on my iPod, and there is a lady with a ragged apron on, walking in circles around the room. I am scared to make any noise. So please, if you see an ad for dark web jobs, don't click it. Update. It's 4.30 now. I made it out of the house and I'm safe. My left leg is hurt a little, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Let me tell you what happened. The lady from the kitchen walked around the room, making soft groans and drooling everywhere. I kept as silent as I could. Freezing time, she turned in my direction. A small beep came from my desk, notifying me that it had turned 3am. The lady in the room melted into the floorboards, screaming a scream of the utmost agony and pain. What I was supposed to do at this point was turn on the music of my iPod, close my eyes and cover my ears. But hiding under the desk, I didn't know if I still had to do that. I waited and waited and silence was all I could find until the walls and floors of the house started to contort. The house shifted and moved into what looked like faces popping out of the walls. The only description of the sound I can think of is a scream of terror itself. I couldn't take it anymore. My mind told me to get up, to run, to get out as fast as I can, but I knew that I couldn't. I closed my eyes and I turned the music on. The screams were drowned out and it seemed almost calming. But in the back of my mind, I knew what was happening around me. The music blared loudly and my eyes stayed glued shut. Then the music turned off. I opened my eyes and the house was normal again. Shakily, I stood up and I looked at the clock. 3.34 I got back onto the desk and I lay there terrified. But nothing happened and I was sitting there for 35 minutes until the final beep from the clock came, telling me that I could finally leave. I got up, walked down the hallway, down the stairs to the front door, and finally, the sweet cool air of the night hit my face. And in that moment, I felt a relief that was almost euphoric. I walked home and I picked up my phone, but when I went to email Mr. Salazar, his email was gone, the website was gone, and there was no trace of him at all. I tried to fall asleep, but I couldn't get the faces out of my head. The look they had can't be explained. I don't know if I'm going to get my money, but at this point, I don't care. I just want to never go back to that house again. Update. It's 6am now. A package somehow appeared at my front door. And inside was $80 and a letter. The letter is as follows. You can't escape. Hello again, Chris. I see that you showed up for your first shift this morning. I appreciate that, but during your shift, you broke one of the rules. I've taken $20 out of your pay because of that. I'm pretty sure you were already aware, but I can tell you don't want to go back. Most people don't. And I'm here to say that you can't escape. By entering that house, you pretty much signed your soul away. No matter what you do, you will always be at that house by 12. That is all. Sincerely, Mr. Salazar. My sleep last night was horrible. I couldn't stop thinking about what had happened on my first shift. The whole day I stayed in bed, terrified for midnight to come, but it had to come eventually. 
11.57. I begged that nothing would happen to me. 11.58. I put my iPod in the trash. 11.59. I lay in bed and I closed my eyes. I feel pressure on my feet, and my soft bed disappears from under me. I open my eyes and I find myself inside that cursed house again, with my iPod and a printed paper of the rules in my hand. What? How was it possible? I think to myself. I ran to the door, slamming my fist against it, wanting a way out, but it was to no avail. I could not leave. I defeatedly walked up the stairs and I sat in the camera room chair. I sat there crying for an hour until one o'clock came, and with it came the man laughing at the TV. I turned the camera off and I continued to sob, not caring about the sounds around me. But then I felt a hand wrap around my neck. I froze and closed my eyes and I tried to control myself. The grip closed tighter and tighter until I could barely breathe, and then it finally left me alone. I gasped for air, and I grabbed the printed paper of rules given to me at the start of my shift. I looked at the printed sheet of rules and at the bottom was a handwritten message from Mr. Salazar himself. Good luck. I looked back up to the cameras and I composed myself. Okay, Chris, you can do this. You've already been here once. Pull it together. I listened, not hearing the TV anymore. I listened, not hearing the TV anymore. I turned the camera on and the clock let out a small beep. It had turned to two o'clock. I stood up to open the blinds, but I hesitated. Did I really want to talk to her again? Regardless, I pushed the thought away, and I opened the blinds to be met with a face only insane people would call a woman. It looked as if she hadn't eaten once in her life. Her skin looked like it was airtight to her bones and she had no meat in her body. Her smile was literally ear to ear. Her skin sagged down at least two feet, and her eye sockets had large, black bloodshot eyes with tiny, beady yellow pupils. Hello again, Chris. I closed the blinds as quickly as I could and I went to hide under the desk. But the desk is just a block. No space to hide under. I don't know what to do. I hear slow footsteps coming up the stairs. God, the doorknob is turning. The door is locked. Oh, thank God I remembered to lock it. She is screeching from behind the door. She's slamming her hands on it. It's only a matter of time until she breaks the whole door down. What do I do? Hi everybody, my name is Jeremy and recently I got laid off by my horrible boss. And I found a website for deep web jobs and I applied for house sitting. I also recently read at Chris's shifts and I think we applied for the same job. Mr. Salazar emailed me something along the same lines. I'll paste his email here. Your application has been accepted. Thank you for applying to the house sitting job. You will stay at the house from 12 a.m. until 4 a.m. And you must follow these rules. Your money will arrive at 6 a.m. after your shift. Always, no matter what you hear or see, stay in the bedroom. Either don't bring your phone or if you do, do not turn it on even if you get a notification. I will not email you during your shift. Arrive at 12 or a little before 12. If you arrive past 12, do not enter the house and send me an email. From 12 until 1, you are allowed to roam the house but make sure to be in the upstairs bedroom by 1. Turn all the lights off, lock the doors and close the blinds. This can happen any time during the night. If you hear loud music from the camera room, put on the hazmat suit that we have provided. Enter the camera room, walk to the security desk. Do not interact with the security guard. 
and turn off the music from the iPod on the desk. Make sure to do this fairly quickly. From 1 until 2, clean up all the clothes in the bedroom and hang them up in the closet. If any clothes have bloodstains, put them in the trash quickly. Make the bed, and if there are more than three sheets, throw away any extra. If you hear a knock at the window, hide under the bed until the entity has entered and left the room. From 2 until 3, put the hazmat suit back on and walk into the downstairs area. If there's a man watching TV, turn the TV off and ignore what the man does. If there is a woman cooking in the kitchen, then turn off the stove and ignore what she does. There is a bathroom connected to the bedroom. If you hear the shower turn on, knock on the door three times, no more no less. If the showering stops, it was done correctly. From 3 until 3.33, lay in bed and close your eyes. Do not fall asleep. Make sure to pull the blankets up to your neck and make sure that they stay there. From 3.34 until 4, your shift is complete and you are allowed to roam the house until 4. Do not leave before 4, and do not leave more than 5 minutes after 4. That is all. Your shift starts tomorrow night at 471 Pedersen Drive. Sincerely, Mr. Salazar. I don't know what this means, but having read Chris's post, I think I'm ready and I can survive. I'm going to type this out after my shift is over. If I survive. I entered the house and I looked around, just as Chris had said. It looked old, but you could live in it just fine. The kitchen and the living room were in pristine condition, and it looked like they were bought yesterday. I walked up the stairs and I walked down the hallway, and I turned right just before the camera room, entering the bedroom. The room had a king-sized bed in it, with clothes and bedsheets scattered around the room. There is a door off to the side of the room, which I assumed was the bathroom. The nightstand next to the bed held a small digital clock and a printed paper of the instructions. The clock gave a small beep signaling my time had started. I bent down and I picked up a couple of pieces of clothes, varying from bras to underwear to hats. I hung them up in the closet and I started to get bored until I found a grey striped shirt with a large crimson stain on it. I immediately threw it in the large garbage can in the corner of the room and I continued with my work. I was picking out the last pieces of clothing, ready to make the bed when I heard five slow, hard knocks in the window across from my bed. My blood ran cold. I dropped the clothing that I was holding and I crawled through to the small space under the bed. It was silent until the door slammed open and a woman, fitting the description that Chris gave, entered the room. I know you're in here. You can't escape. I'll find you eventually. I held my breath for as long as I could. She started to get angry and slammed her frail hands on the nearest things around her. She screamed in anger, wanting only to trap me in this house. Eventually, she laughed and slammed the door behind her. I got up from under the bed and I quickly collected the sheets and I made the bed, making sure to throw away the extra two sheets. Only 2.45? I thought. And then came the loud music from the room next door. I calmly but scaredly put on my hazmat suit and I opened the door. I cautiously stepped out into the hallway and I saw down the stairs, a man watching TV. I opened the door to the camera room slowly, and I saw a man, if you can even call it that, sitting in the chair. He had rotten, dead skin, and he sat with such a hunch that his back was almost at a 90 degree angle. I walked over to the desk and I spotted the iPod. Keep calm, Chris. Keep calm. The guard repeated to himself. 
I gave him a look of sympathy as he stared up at me with terrified eyes. I grabbed the iPod and I turned the music off. Chris covered his ears and kept repeating that same phrase. I walked back to the bedroom. Just in time for the clock to give a small beep to turn to 2am. Let's be honest, Chris is dead. The house had trapped his soul and it forced him to work there for eternity. The reason I signed up was to find a way to release these trapped souls. And I think that the entity has something to do with all of this. I kept the hazmat suit on and I walked down the stairs. The man was sitting on the couch watching a cooking show on the TV. I walked over and I looked at the man. He had polished hair, combed over to the side like he was a rich person. He had a nice suit, tie, and pants on, but his face looked like it had been rotting for years. The bone was showing in more than three places, and I'm pretty sure that I saw a glob of skin fall from his face. His laughs were hoarse and deep like he didn't have any vocal cords. I turned the TV off and the man froze mid-laugh and then melted into the couch seams. I shuddered and I returned to my place upstairs. I entered and took about 10 minutes to take the hazmat suit off, only to be met with the sound of a warm shower. I came closer to the bathroom door and I put my ear against it. I heard a lady humming lightly. I knocked three times. The humming and water stopped immediately after the third knock. It felt unsettling how quickly it became silent. But faint off in the distance, I heard sizzling eggs. I quickly put the hazmat suit on and I rushed down the stairs. The woman was cooking black eggs. She was like the man watching TV. Her apron and hat were pristine, spotless. But her skin was, although in better shape than the man's, rotting. I reached for the oven dial, but I stopped. Please, please keep it on. Please. The woman repeated with a soft voice. Regardless, I turned the dial to zero. The woman melted and I returned back to the bedroom. I thought this was going to be easy, but now I know what Chris felt. It is insanely scary being inside this house. 258. I pull the bed sheets up. 259. I get into bed. 3 o'clock. I close my eyes and I get comfortable. The bed is surprisingly soft, and I feel as if I could fall asleep even if a train was running right above me. I thought about everything else I had seen that night, and that scared me awake for a few minutes. But it was a constant struggle to stay awake and conscious, but I knew that I would become like Chris if I fell asleep. Finally, the clock beeped and the bed felt like it became stone, and I climbed out confused. I now had free time to walk around the house until 4. I checked in the camera room and Chris had disappeared. I waited patiently for 4 to come and when it did, I went home and I started plotting a plan. Like many of you suggested to Chris, tomorrow I'm going to bring a knife and a lighter. I'm going to try to stab the entity and hopefully I can survive. I'll update you all again tomorrow. Wish me luck. Oh Jesus. The plan did not work as planned. I'm hurt but I survived. Let me tell you what happened. Just because many of you were asking, I went back during the day but the house wasn't there. Like many of you proposed, I took with me a bear trap and a large knife. I entered the house and I looked around. It looked the same and I placed the bear trap right outside the bedroom door. Again, like you guys suggested, I tried unplugging the TV before the man appears. But when I went to pull it out, it was like the cable was a part of the wall. It was completely stuck and I couldn't manage to unplug it. 
The night started and it went as normal as it could. But while I was in the middle of cleaning up the clothes, I noticed that the bed had no hiding space under it. I had to come up with a new plan on the spot. My plan was, while I was sleeping from 3 to 3.33, and the antiquity was above me, I would take my knife and stab her. But now it looked like I wouldn't even make it to that. I hear the knocking on the door. The entity signals that it's coming and I panic. Where would I hide? I grab the knife and I crawl to a small space behind the door. I would have to stab her as she came in or as she was hit by the trap. I hear a step. The entity comes closer. Another. I tightened my grip on the knife. Again. A bead of sweat drips down my face. I hear a clang. The sound of the bear trap closing and a high-pitched demonic scream after it. I open the door and with all my might, I swing at the entity in front of me. The knife slides clean into one of the entity's eyes and black goo starts spurting from the wound. The entity screams, revealing at least 100 sets of tiny sharp teeth. It clenches my hand in its mouth and I scream out in pain. Me and the entity fall over on top of each other and roll around for a while. I got scratched a couple of times and I stabbed her a couple of times. But finally, I pinned her down and I stabbed until I knew without a shadow of a doubt that she was dead. I stood up, my arm bleeding profusely and I used a piece of clothing to wrap my wound. I didn't care about the rules anymore. I just killed the thing running this place. I sat down in the bed and I rested for a few moments. Throughout the rest of the night, nothing happened and just to make sure, I stayed until 4 and then I left. When I arrived at my house, there was a letter stapled to my door, written by Mr. Salazar. I'll reread what he said here. Wow, I have to say that I'm impressed. You managed to kill my best worker. It seems that you have already figured out my plan. The workers have normal shifts the first day, and then on the second day, their safe place is taken away. But you, you made it work. Come back to my house tomorrow as if it was a normal shift and we can discuss a reward. That is all. Sincerely, Mr. Salazar. I don't know what he'll do or what he'll give me, but I don't think I have an option to not go. Wish me luck. Now throughout my first two shifts, I was very calm, but after reading that letter, I was more than a little scared. I spent the day preparing, I hid a knife, a small gun, body armor under my clothes. I was going to be ready for whatever he was going to do. I arrive at the house and I enter as normal. The inside of the house is completely different. It's no longer a house but a chamber a tunnel down to the earth. I slowly walked down the stairs, ready to pull out my gun. I reach the final step and I arrive in a blue room with many monitors and a large man sitting in a chair. Hello Jeremy, I am Mr. Salazar. The man turned his chair around and I got a good look at him. He had a black goatee, balding black hair, and a dark suit on. Um, hi, what is this place? This is my viewing chamber. I spend all my time here watching the house, monitoring my workers. He had a deep, scary voice. Well, what happened to the house after I killed that thing? Once the house lost its best worker, the other workers suspended their existence and the house would do nothing tonight. But if it doesn't have a new best worker by tomorrow, then the workers are released from the house's grip and they will destroy and kill anything they come across. So why are you doing this? Because Jeremy, it is simply the only way to contain these workers. Then who's going to be the next best worker? Well Jeremy, I'm looking right at him. 
His mouth twisted into a sinister grin. Me? Yes, you. Killing my best worker and touching that black liquid caused a transformation to begin. In the next day, you will see your muscles and me disappearing. Your skin will become stuck to your bones. Your face will sag. Your eyes will turn black and yellow. Your teeth will fall out. And you will grow an unsatiable desire to return to this house. What? I'm going to become like that thing. Unfortunately for you, yes. You can leave for now if you would like, but it is inevitable. I stood in disbelief for a few moments. Was I really going to become that thing? I turned around and I ran out of the door. When I came out of the door, I was standing in front of my house and behind me, the house disappeared. It's been a few hours and I'm noticing that I'm losing my muscles and I have a really strong feeling to go back to that cursed house. My eyes have turned to dark gray and I don't think that I can stay away from that house for much longer. I know that I can't stop what's happening to me. All I can do is just go back to that house. Wish me luck.